uh, ready to roll? I'm so yeah. ready. <laughs> Great. Uh, well, first of all, Robert, thank you for talking uh, to me here at Film Threat. Um, just a huge fan of your work from uh, The Witch, which just blew my mind. Um, and I have a quick question about The Witch before we talk about The Northman. Um, every time I bring up the movie, sometimes some movie nerds will try to correct me and say it's the Vavitch. Is That was just a marketing thing, right? Um, it's not, anyone who thinks it's the Vavitch is out of their mind. Like, but <laughs> basically, it, you know, in the early modern period, you'll often see in large typefaces <clears throat> um, using two V's instead of a W. Uh, it was just a sort of like, you know, you, you'll see like a carrot, like a Latin W as well, but, but oftentimes you see it's the two V's and I just thought it like looked uh, cool and transportive. So that's why I did that. And it totally works. It's great. Uh, for this film, you were, uh, you and Alexander Skarsgård, I think your clandestine meeting, and uh, you know, just really contributed to making this thing work and his appreciation for your attention to detail. Uh, can you tell me about when the two of you first met and he'd been wanting to make a Viking film for a long time? Uh, what was that meeting like and, and what were some of the things you talked about in the conversation about the vision for this movie? Uh, <clears throat> well, yeah, we met at Cafe Mogador in the East Village. Uh, I was late. Um, <laughs> I don't know. We, you know, we, we talked about, um, we talked about sagas. We talked about, uh, mythology. Uh, you know, I, I, I was really, it was a really nascent period for me in my understanding of Viking culture. Like I had, I had read a little bit of Icelandic sagas and take, taken a trip to Iceland and it was, and I had just kind of like awoken a, a bit of interest there. Uh, you know, Alex was talking about blood eagles, which at the time I didn't know what a blood eagle was, which is for your readers. Uh, well, why don't you Google it? Uh, <laughs> actually, but um, yeah, so, uh, but we were just, just, you know, nerding out and, and getting excited. Um, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I think, I think where, uh, where things really started to get uh, intense is when I, about a month later, sent Alex my, my first treatment and the suggestion, uh, which was, you know, my first whack at the story that became the Northman and, uh, and also my suggestion that Shone uh, should, should co-write it with me. The setting is practically a character in the film. Can you talk about how that influenced you? Well, I mean, the you know, it was the the landscapes of Iceland that got me inspired to pick up the Icelandic sagas in the first place because I wasn't interested in Vikings before that. And I think, um, you know, in, in the press notes, I think that I talk about the fact that you know, uh, I usually turn to the art of the period um, that I'm and, and the culture that I'm portraying to kind of understand like how the film should look visually. But Viking art is very stylized and there's no atmosphere. So the landscapes and the elements really are, do so much work for like for the atmosphere of the, of the film, so much work, you know, and uh and you know along with the fire and ice and mud and dung and flame and whatever else <laughs> can you talk about that um just the brutality of this movie is something that i think people almost every everyone who comments about the film talks about that how did you how did you capture that type of realism i mean there are certain fights i mean many of them were i just don't know how somebody didn't get really hurt. So how did you capture that? I think the idea is just trying to think about it realistically. I mean, uh, I mean, I mean, if we're really talking about realistically, some of the shield bashes that Alex gets fighting the undead Viking are a bit like over the top and not particularly realistic. However, <laughs> 
you were fighting like a seven foot one tall corpse with superhuman strength maybe it is realistic <laughs> you know I, but i think you just you just try to you know, I, I think I think one of the, you know one of the main things is like sound design. You know the like the it's still it, they the, the, the okay it's still louder than it would be in reality. But like the sounds of the swords coming out of their scabbards, ten is the sound of a, a, a piece of metal coming out of leather instead of metal for metal. Usually they go like shink, even though like that the noise would be utterly silent. We still have something, but it's more subdued when you know when you're working with uh in a, in a big uh like battle scene or in here here in this circumstance like a, a raid of a village uh so like so much of the dialogue for of the of the crowd is done later but we did like i i found like we had a lot of uh extras who spoke slavic languages and we wrote um, you know, like lines in this proto Ukrainian, uh, with this U U Ukrainian poet, U Yuri Andreevich. Um, and, uh, they were like, we did a big session of them doing their lines while like screaming and really getting into it. And then when we did stuff in post, I think sometimes these crowd performers tend to just rely on their technique. But I was saying, like, we, you know, we need to feel this. Like, this can't just be like a movie where, like, you understand that, like, these people's lives are being destroyed. Like, we need to feel that these people's lives are being destroyed. And so I need to ask you to, like, take the time to, like, actually get into character and, like, and experience, like, losing your child or your husband instead of just, like, screaming, you know? So, and it's that kind of care that hopefully, like, in these places that, like adds to the level of a kind of brutality that seems more believe a little more believable in a film of the size. Well, it, it definitely translates down to, you know, simple details like, you know, props and, and things that were used. There's even, it was mentioned in the press notes of bone flute players were uh, involved. I, 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 so what went into your research about the era? Uh, everything, you know, everything like you know, Shannon and I did a lot of research, but then w once the film became real, we, we had the great fortune to bring on the world's finest Viking historians and, and archeologists and, uh, to, to help us out. So, uh, I mean, there was no stone left unturned basically. And Alexander Skarsgård's contribution to the project, um, you know, as a producer and someone who's wanted to tell a story that you were able to put together, how, what is the collaboration with the two of you working together? He seemed so committed to the role. Yeah, I mean, I, I, it's, it's, it's awesome to have an actor from the beginning who brings that kind of passion to it and, and that kind of dedication. And, and so he, you know, he, W refused anything but perfection uh, from himself. I mean, Alex has talked a lot about me sort of driving him to the edge of sanity or when we were shooting the movie. But I mean, there, there were, I can think of more than one time when Alex asked for another take because he felt he could do better. And I also want to compliment you on the, the trailer for the film, which for, for it, it doesn't ruin the movie in the sense that we're only seeing uh, footage from perhaps the first third, maybe half of the film. And what, I, I can only think of one other time where that was the case. That was The Dark Knight by Christopher Nolan. Are you involved in any of those marketing choices and keeping things secret? Because I will say it added to the enjoyment of the film. I must have watched the original the first trailer probably 50 times. And once it got to a certain point in the story, I said, I don't know where this is going. And that actually contributed greatly to, I think, the enjoyment where so many films marketing these days kind of just ruin everything. Thanks. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm very, very deeply in, involved. And, but I'll also, I'll also say that it was really Focus, Focus's marketing team who felt strongly that, they, that we did need to communicate kind of the first act narratively in the first trip. Mm -hmm not an IP movie that people know and we need to communicate what this story is. The second trailer 
which I was, which is more closely my brainchild. Though again, it was incredibly collaborative with the very talented team that Focus had. Um, you know, that's sort of what I probably would have wanted the first trailer to be, but they were right to do it the way they did it. They were very right to do it the way they did it. Um, but yeah. And what makes you so drawn to stories from the past? Quentin Tarantino said he, his favorite era is anyone, any time before cell phones. So, <laughs> which, which I think is great, but what, what are your thoughts on that? Like great stories being told in the past? You know, I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I don't know. And pe but people ask me it all the time. And I wish I had a definitive answer. But, um, but I, I, you know, my, my parents were interested in the past. And so was my grandfather. So I certainly had, like, people around me growing up that made me interested in them. But that, who gives, who gives, who, no one cares about my childhood. Basically, like something that I've been saying lately is that growing up in a secular society, um, you know, you're the sacred and the sublime aren't really around. And, uh, and I think if using this movie, for example, you know, in the Viking age, there's no atheists, uh, you know, and, and their mythology and religion is just like, there's not a question of belief. It, it, it just exists. And I find that, uh, very interesting and compelling. Uh, I don't know how much time I have, but I want to ask you about your writing process. If you have a moment, like, what do you, what do you do for yourself to get in the zone? And what was your, what was your working relationship with Sion? If I pronounce that correctly. <laughs> yeah. yeah Basically. I mean, you know, I listen to a lot of music, light a lot of candles and incests, incense, uh, keep the room dark, uh, lots of uh creepy imagery on the walls uh and but yeah you know um Shion's great to work with uh he's super uh generous egoless in the in the process uh and i mean he's just brilliant and he's so fast but basically um you know i wrote a treatment we went to iceland together I went to Iceland, visit him together. We wrote a long, a longer treatment. Then he did an even longer one. I gave him a bunch of notes and then he wrote the script, uh, the first version. I gave him a lot of notes, next version. Then I revised that. And then we just passed the script and scenes and like lines and words back and forth millions and millions of times, like all through the rest of the shoot. Cause it, you know, because through post-production there continued to be there was like a little bit of additional photography and there was also like tons of ADR uh, to like really hone and get this thing precise. So it was, I mean, it was an incredibly, incredibly enjoyable collaboration and I'm working with him again. Awesome. Well, I can't wait to see what you do next. And I also can't wait to see the Northman again. Uh, thank you so much, Robert, for talking to me. I appreciate it. My pleasure. Cool. Take care. Yep. <laughs> and we're back. Yeah, uh, he he he's been, he's been through the ringer that far, so far. Well, I I got the sense, and thank you. We're gonna get to your chat uh, questions and comments in just a second. But I I feel that like it 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 definitely got the feeling that he'd been doing this all day. Yeah. I mean, you heard the Freudian slip at the end, which a bunch of people <laughs> pointed out, like the uh, yeah, I, I heard it. <laughs> candles and incest. <laughs> I'm just, okay. <laughs> That is funny. It's a funny Freudian slip. A uh, couple of super chats here. Let's get to them uh, real quick. I want to. I want to thank like right here. Infinite Maine says, "Amazing interview. You made the most out of the short time given. Not my first rodeo, I'll say. Uh, thank you, Infinite Maine, for the ten bucks. I, look, I do the. I do the best I can under the circumstances. Yeah. So what can I do? I just that I'm very self-deprecating, very like self-critical. So I can't ever say anything nice about myself i know i maybe i should work on that snow miser for 4.99 says robert can you make a samurai movie i feel your directing style and storytelling would make a great samurai film unfortunately um it was a pre-recorded interview uh that's something that i would have liked to have asked i kind of tried to ask like about making films in the past that's something that quentin tarantino said like he would make a movie any in any era before cell phones he kind of is not 
into the modern era at all. There was another super chat earlier. Well, I'll answer that question for him. Yes, I'll make a samurai movie. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, look, it'd be nice. It'd be nice. But it'd be um, nice, yes. yeah, yeah. Wait, there was another 1999 super chat here. How do I get? I can't. How do I click on that? I thought. I think you got them all. I posted it up. Did I get them all? Yeah, I actually, missed... you posted it up during the interview. Okay, cool. Uh, Nick uh, Ken Bogus says I have a choice today. Nick Cage or Northman? Help me decide, Chris. You're my only hope. What to watch first? Well, it depends on your mood. If you want a good comedy, the Nick Cage movie, The Unbearable Weight of Massive Talent, is great. You should watch the review that Alan and I did after you see it. Check that out. The Northman, if you want something uh, a little more heavy, I mean, uh, you know, something that's heavy, epic, uh, Viking by way of Macbeth, uh, Go see The Northman. It's also brutal and bloody and gory and and um, borderline art film. But so Nick Cage movies more light. Northman is heavier. You choose. Depends on your mood. Let's get to some of the comments that were that you were starred. Maybe you can help me, Alan, and star yeah. some of the comments. Redmond says, "I think the relationship between main characters should have been more fleshed out. They kind of go from strangers to making babies. I think we got to that one." Uh, Fletcher Williams says, press junkets are the modern day kissing the Don's ring. In a sense, I mean, when I worked at G4, I did a lot of junket interviews. In fact, I interviewed Johnny Depp once um, at a junket in Paris, and uh, he was stoned the whole time and he spoke very slow. So seeing him in court is pretty much the same <laughs> as when he was high out of his mind. And I'll, I, I'll, I'll, I have a video maybe to defend myself on this. Patrick Lemire says he looks like a Northman fresh out of his lighthouse and good job with the Vivich says Adam Iglesias. <laughs> it's funny that he, I, I would just like, I've had friends correct me. No, I call that movie the Vivich. It's like, no, that's a, and he pointed out like, that's how the, a W was back then. It was, I think it added to sort of the, you know, like the way that the movie was marketed, but I love that he said that anyone who calls it the Vivich is an idiot is yeah. a moron. Um, Patrick Lemire says, I honestly think the Vavitch was a graphic choice that made SEO work, which is a common word. Vavitch is highly uncommon. Yes. And he wanted to, um, he wanted to kind of change like witches have become comical, right? So in just popular culture, when you go to a uh, party city during October and you see witches and they're like these cartoon witches, they're not very threatening. They're not scary. What, what Robert Eggers wanted to do, and you can see he talks about this in interviews, he wanted to take the witch and make it take the concept of a witch and make it scary again because the witch had been kind of, you know, become comical in a cartoon. Infinite Main says, hard-hitting question off the start. Well, I wanted to <laughs> sort of dumb, embarrassing question. Maybe I pissed him off. I have no idea. Holy hand grenades. In Spanish, W is sometimes said double V, which means double V. Double V, which means double V. Interesting. Bowfuls, Beowulf's Revenge says, blood eagles are brutal. There you go. Adam Iglesias again says he talks so genuinely about his stuff. He's so passionate and it's nice to see a director talk about stuff he enjoys. Max one up the dark souls boss fight for the magic sword was awesome. Jack D Ripper. I fought many undead Vikings. It was spot on. <laughs> That's great. Infinite main says Eggers looks like he could have been in the film. Actually. Yeah. He probably could have been like, Someone in the background, for sure. Uh, Steve R says, I thank you. I think you undersold yourself on this, Chris. Interview is fine. He's going really in depth. Well, thank you for that. I'm, like I said, I'm very self deprecating and uh, I never feel like I do a good enough job. Like I can always do better. So I never kind of leave an experience with like, great job, Chris. I'm always like, ah, nah, I could have done better on that. I could have written that better. I could have done a better thing. I could have, it, this goes for anything I do creatively. I'm always like, you could have done better. Ken Bogus says, Edgar's going to fall asleep. I would positive fandom. This is the one. I think we put it up positive yeah. fandom for 1999. Thank you for that. Thank you so much, Mr. Eggers. Congratulations on such a spectacular film. I think you are leading the way towards more in-depth films. Our society needs right now. Thank you, Chris, as always. And a heart and a diamond emoji. I'll take that. Thank you. Positive fandom. Um, Infinite main, all the scars guard scars guards seem deeply invested in their roles. Yeah. They're awesome. They should, all be in a movie together at some point. Patrick Lemire Eggers looks like he's on his 20th interview of the day. Yeah, I kind of got that sense too. He's just sort of like in the hotel room 
He's just had the world premiere, walked the red carpet, partied um, with people. And I, I, I talked to a friend of mine who went to the world premiere who said that when he introduced um, Nicole Kidman, he's very aware of the AMC video where people clap. Yeah. And it's like, yes, and here's where we, he made a reference to her AMC uh, the AMC video, which everyone applauds when that comes on because they know the movie's coming on next. And it's just sort of, a, it's cheesy. It's funny. Uh, Lagbait says, you can kind of tell when he gets involved in the questions and when he goes into typical question mode. That's yeah. that's typical. That's why I don't like to interview necessarily filmmakers when they're doing that, like one after the other, you know, one after the other. It just, it just, it gets tiresome. It gets, it, it, and, and I feel, and I kind of, I, I have empathy actually for, you know, the people being interviewed, they're doing this all day. And some of the questions, I, I don't want to disparage people. I don't want to disparage anybody from, you know, I don't want to disparage anybody from like any, any of my colleagues say who do junket type interviews, but I really wish they prepared more. And I really wish that sometimes I've seen some, incredibly embarrassing questions like that are like of a personal nature. I really don't care about the personal life of a particular, you know, celebrities. I wish, like I say, in many ways, I wish I knew less about the personal lives of celebrities. I, having said that, um, he said, you don't want to hear about you know my life as a kid. If I had more time, I probably would have pressed him on that. Like how did, you know, like a lot of things that, you know, that we grew up with, whether it's novels we've read when we were kids or experiences that we've had can really resonate into adulthood. Right. I mean, like, wasn't avatar for James Cameron, like a story he wrote as a kid. It maybe kind of feels like it. Anyways. Um, Goober says, uh, Valhalla appears to have a great dental plan. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Um, let's see. Did I miss some super chats here? No, uh, I think we got them all. Cool. You know, the, the other uh, interview questions I hate are when they want to do games or something like that. Some something unrelated to the uh, the movie, but, you know, what they think is, uh, you know, who'd you do or kill Mary? Yeah, like yeah. those questions, like those embarrassing questions. I, I, I find those like I feel embarrassed, like for people who do that job and ask questions. I like okay. to go more in depth to um, so. Yeah, uh, let's see. There was a question here I wanted to get to. Um, uh, is RRR, RRR, mm, yeah, positive fandom. Yes, there you go, RRR. Uh, which is your favorite movie until now, asks Indian Cinema. Well, I would say this year, let's just start with this year as like my favorite movie. We'd be here all day. We'd be having a two-hour conversation as I debate myself about what my favorite... <laughs> But I will say this, uh, I believe this year, two films I've seen that my favorite of the year are RRR and The Northman. So far this year. Some might say, why am I not saying The Batman? I enjoyed The Batman and had many, many problems with it. We are, we are, uh, yeah, Avatar was visually stunning. True, Beowulf's Revenge. But it's interesting, I think like how a director grew up does inform like what experience did they have? Did they live in another part of the world and then come to the United States or, you know, what, you know, what experiences did they have as a kid? And, you know, if I have an opportunity to interview Robert Eggers, uh, may, I doubt he'll remember me, but I will follow up on that. Patrick Lemire says people did not automatically have terrible teeth back in the day. No bags of chips and sugar in the Viking diet. Ah, that's true. 